Hey folks, welcome to this episode on orbitals and quantum numbers. As we've seen before with light, we saw that light behaved as a duality. It, was, it could act as a wave and a particle depending on its interactions. Um, from these studies, uh, we also saw that energy was quantized and that was given to us by Einstein. Uh, Bohr kind of worked on this and said that electrons can exist in discrete energy levels around a uh, nucleus in an atom, but they can only change energy levels when they absorb a certain amount of energy, called the quanta of energy, uh, and if they drop down to a lower state energy or the ground state energy, uh, they release energy, and again, that quantized amount. De Broglie said, well, if light can behave as both a wave and a particle, why well, can't all matter behave as a wave and a particle? And so uh, this, a similar experiment was set up uh, as we saw with light. Light was passed through these double slits here, and what was expected was these two bright spots, but we ended up getting an interference pattern. So the same experiment was set up. In this case, there was a source of electrons that was going through this double slit, and again, was, was, what was expected was that you have two bright spots in line with the slits here. However, just like with light, what was seen was that there was an interference pattern on the board in the back, meaning that this, these electrons that are being passed through here are actually interfering with one another and creating this characterized interference pattern as we saw with light. So De Broglie pulled from this was that matter actually behaves as both a wave and a particle. The argument though was, well, why can't we see it during in real life? Uh, well, the wavelength is so small, times 10 to negative 34, that it was too small for its properties to be, to be detected in real life. Now, what this brings about was that electrons travel around a nucleus in a wave. Uh, and they do so, if you can just follow my pen here, you can see that the wave is kind of going about itself and keeps going around and around and around. This is, is, is an allowed orbit because the electron can, it doesn't actually interfere destructively upon itself. If you look at this one over here, you can see that this wavelength uh, is a little bit different, and this wavelength in this kind of in this uh, diameter actually doesn't allow it to kind of loop over. It will actually start uh, destructively interfering with one with itself, and so as a result, this type of orbit is not allowed. The only types of orbits that are allowed are ones that do not allow the electron to uh, destructively interfere with one its one uh, with itself. And this is called a quantized orbit. As a result, you can see that if we increase this diameter of the circle or decrease the diameter of the circle in, in using the same wavelength, um, it, it won't cause that, that full loop over. It will cause some uh, destructive interference. And therefore, some orbits are just not possible. Now, the question was, well, I want to see how these electrons travel through this double split. So how, how can we do this? Uh, so what they tried to do was actually put a measuring device, in this case a laser beam, to measure and see what the electrons were doing as they were passing through these slits. They were curious. But what was, and you know, as we saw before, as the electrons went through, they created an interference pattern that was on the back. But once they set up this measuring device, something strange happened. They actually just saw two bright spots in, in congruency with these slits over here. So as they, measure, as they put, set up this measuring device, the actual nature of the electron was changed. Without the measuring device, we saw an interference pattern. With the measuring device, we saw two bright lines. So what came from this was that you cannot accurately know the position and the momentum of something small, like an electron, at the same time. You either know one or you know the other. You can't know both. And this is the basis of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. As he said that it's impossible to know both the exact momentum and the exact location of an electron in space at the same time. So if it's not possible to know both, well, we, we can basically uh, have maybe show a probability. Okay? Um, so the best thing that we could do, instead of having it, we knew that electron, we couldn't figure this out. We wouldn't be able to know the momentum and the position at any time. So what we did is if, if we know if we know the momentum, we could kind of guess the position, or if we knew the position, we could, we could um, statistically guess the uh, momentum. And so the best thing that we could do is describe the probability that an electron will be found around um, the nucleus in an atom. So just a note on electron and energy. Uh, again, these are complementary uh, 
properties, whereas in the, no the more you know about the energy of the electron, the less, about, the less you know about the position. Now, if you can follow me where I'm going with this, remember that around an atom, we have energy levels. Okay? So if we know that an electron is in a specific energy level, then we know less about its actual position. So what started happening was that we could start predicting the, the probability of finding an electron in that energy level. And what we, what we call these are electron clouds or orbitals. So you can see here that you can have this 1s, 2s, 3s. The 1, 2, and 3 refer to the energy levels. So in, just like your periods on the periodic table, this is energy level 1 or period 1. Uh, at 2s would be period 2 and energy level 2, etc., etc. The s refers to what we call an orbital. Now the s in this case is actually a spherical orbital, as we see over here. But all it is, is it defines the probability of finding an electron in that specific energy level. So orbitals, electron clouds, however you want to call it, is all about probability. So Schrodinger defined uh, this probability as a wave function. And the size, the shape, and the orientation of these orbitals were determined by integers called quantum numbers. Now there are four quantum numbers, um, but there are th only three that describe the orbitals. The other fourth quantum number talks about the electrons in these orbitals. So the three quantum numbers that we're going to um, talk about is the principal quantum number defined by n, the angular momentum number defined by l, and the magnetic quantum number defined by m sub l. So the principal quantum number, it talks about um, the energy of the electrons in that particular orbital. Now, the bigger the value of n, the bigger the orbital. Um, if you remember we, just a few slides ago, we had the 1s orbital. It was a sphere. Uh, and then we had our 2s orbital, which is a lot bigger. They're both spheres as characterized by the s. Um, but you could see that as we increase the number 1, 2, and then the third one was much bigger, uh, the size got bigger. Now, how does that have to relate with energy? Well, it has to deal with potential energy. If we had 1, 2, and 3, um, if this was energy level number 1, number 2, and number 3, the potential energy increases as you go farther away from the nucleus. So the bigger it is, the more energy it will have. Now, in some books, you might see these, uh, these energy levels denoted as, um, as letters. We're not really going to use it, but this is simply there to, to show you if you do come across that. Uh, and the given ma the maximum amount of electrons in an energy level is given to, by, to you by the equation 2n uh, to the power of 2. That w that's something that you can use to check as we go along. The angular momentum quantum number defined by L, it characterizes the shape of the orbital. So as we said before, this s orbital is characterized by a spherical shape. Now there are different types of orbitals, p, d, and f. And uh, here's just a kind of brief uh, description of how they look. P's look like two balloons tied in knots, so they're kind of sometimes talked as uh, dumbbells. D's are uh, like clover leaves that are like this, and then the F's uh, have eight balloons tied in at a knot, uh, and they also vary a little bit as well. However, when we're looking at the numbers, these numbers, the values, are what we use to help define these different orbitals. So the only allowable uh, values of L are 0 to uh, n minus 1. So what that means is that if n was equal to 1, the only value for L would be 0, because 0 and then n minus 1, so 1 minus 1, would also be 0. So the only allow allowable value is 0. So once again, the, the principal quantum number des that defines uh, the size, or also the energy. The s, or the angular uh, momentum quantum number, defines the, the shape of the orbital. So and because these are both s, they're both going to be spherical, but because we have a difference here, we have 1, here we have 2, this one will have more energy and also be much bigger. Number 3 is our magnetic quantum number, which is m sub l. Uh, and this is related to the orientation of these orbitals in 3D space. Now, it also defines those, uh, those number of, of orbitals. Um, and the possible values are negative L to positive L. So if we go with, uh, for example, L is equal to 1, uh, if we go back, uh, a, um, a orbital that was equal to 1 would be equal to a P orbital. Um, but what we would see is that there's actually three types of P orbitals because the M sub L would be equal to negative 1, 
0, and 1. As you can see right here, it's negative L to plus L. So L is equal to 1, it's negative 1, 0, and 1. So where are our three p orbitals? Well, again, these show the orientation in 3D space. We're going to have one on the x-axis, which is px, one on the y-axis, py, and then one on the z-axis, pz. So again, our L value is 1, which defines the type of orbital you'll find. Uh, P means, meaning that dumbbell shape. The M sub L, or the ML, will give you the orientation of those orbitals and also show you how many there are. So in this case, there is three values, there's three orientations, and so we have three individual orbitals. Now, it, gets, it does get complicated. When you get L equals to 2, you're going to have negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2, and these give you different orientations in 3D space. Uh, and then also you can go into L is equal to 3, which you have uh, F orbitals, and you have 7 of those. Here you have these, and you have all these orientations as well. You're not going to be needing to know these, uh, but it does uh, get complicated as you go further. And the fourth one is electron spin, which is M sub S. Uh, and this indicates the orientation of the electrons in the orbital. So again, the, the first three quantum numbers talk about the size, shape, and orientation of the orbitals, while the fourth one talks about the electrons in those orbitals. Uh, now, there's going to be an, a, a little principle that we we'll talk about a little bit later. It's called Pauli exclusion principle. and says that, that no two electrons can have the same quantum numbers. And so to kind of go away from this, we have two values. Now, each orbital... Um, for example, if you had px, py, and pz, uh, they can only hold a maximum of two electrons each. So the way to do this is that we actually show a spin. That would be that would be represented of one electron. Um, so again, we could put one electron in each of these orbitals. So each of these orbitals have electron here, up to here, electron here, and this kind of arrow up denotes a kind of upspin, if you will. Uh, so if we we're defining this electron, okay, we would define it using an n value showing what energy level it is. We would use an m uh, an l value showing that it's in the p orbital. We would use an ml value showing that it's in the px um, uh, orbital, and then we would have to define this. And because this is a positive spin, we define it as plus one half. Now we because we can hold two electrons per orbital, we can put another electron here, and this one would be negative a half. So this first one would be plus a half, and this other one would be negative a half. So here's a little summary of, of, of these uh, quantum numbers. Again, in the first level, you can have n is equal to uh, 1, and the only value for l is, remember, it's 0 to n minus 1. So the only value that you can have is 0. Uh, the ML value is related to your L value, and that's negative L to positive L. Now, if L is 0, that means your ML is 0. So you're going to have a 1S orbital, and your orientation is spherical. It's in all directions. When you go to N minus 2, what you're going to have is you're going to have, so if N is equal to 2, remember that L is equal to 0 to N minus 1. So, so L could be... Um, well, n minus 1, uh, sorry, excuse me, you'd have 2 minus 1, which would give you 1. So it'd be any value between 0 and n minus 1, which would be 0 and 1. So we have l is equal to 0 and l is equal to 1. Remember that 0 is giving you s, and 1 shows you that they're going to be p orbitals. Now, the ml value, again, is negative l to positive l. So the only ml value you're going to have here is 0, so that's going to be a 2s orbital, the orientation is in the xyz components. Now when it comes to p, remember that ml is related to l. So if l is equal to 1, ml will be negative 1, it will be 0, and it will be positive 1. So you have three orbitals in your p orbital. So that would be px, py, pz. And so here you have them over here. And then you can keep going forward and forward, third level. You start getting into the L is equal to 2, which is your Ds. And remember that in your Ds, you're going to have five uh, orbitals in different, uh, in different orientations. So the last little bit is, why do, we, why do we call it atom spherical? Well, if you actually start putting all these different orbitals together, you actually compound them and you create this kind of, uh, you can see all these individual orbital um, kind of balloons, if you will. Um, and they eventually create something that's a little bit more spherical. So thanks very much for watching. In the next episode, we're going to be working with these quantum numbers a little bit more. 
uh, and putting them into some uh, practice. Thanks very much for watching. See you soon.